Have you ever walked into a yarn shop or craft store only to be overwhelmed by all the choices? Which yarn is right for your project? And the labels can be so confusing that sometimes they don't help very much. If you've ever been frustrated by trying to figure out how much yarn you'll need for a project or what yarn would be a good substitute for another, when it seems like yarn is packaged willy-nilly, then keep on watching to learn a few simple things that will allow you to better understand yarn weights. Hi everybody and welcome back to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. You might have noticed that I'm changing the format of the show a little bit and what I've decided to do is streamline things. In my main videos, which will come out weekly, I'm going to focus on the classroom segment, whatever the topic is for that week. And then I'm going to have separate videos maybe every other week for book reviews and other miscellaneous things. And those will be called U University Ancillaries because ancillary just means something that is extra or supplementary. That means that you'll, some weeks you'll get two videos. I think this will be easier for me and viewers who are only interested in the classroom segment can just watch that. And those who are interested in the other things can watch those videos as well. So I hope you enjoy this new simplified format. Today I'm going to try to explain and clarify some things about yarn weights. The term yarn weights itself is widely misunderstood. The labels used to specify that a yarn is a certain weight really refer to how thick the yarn is rather than how much it weighs. So for example, you can see in this picture that the yarns on the bottom are very thick or larger in diameter and the yarns at the top of the picture are thinner or smaller in diameter. In yarn lingo, heavier weight means thicker yarns and lighter weight means thinner yarns. Traditionally, yarn was sold by weight, and this is why we still refer to yarns as being heavy or light rather than thick or thin. Knitting mills, for example, purchase their yarn in pounds rather than in yards, and hand knitters purchase yarn in packages sold by weight. Today, most yarns are sold either in 50 gram balls or 100 gram skeins or hanks like these. This is a little bit backward because as knitters, what we really need to know is not how much the skein weighs, but how many yards or meters it will take to make a particular project. And actually, it's more accurate to buy yarn based on yardage than on weight. So why are we stuck with buying yarn by weight? Well, hundreds of years ago, every community of spinners and weavers had their own sizing system for yarns. And these systems were different across countries and even different regions of a, of a country. To make matters worse, there was also different measuring system for each kind of fiber. So you had a separate numbering system for cotton, a separate one for linen, and a separate one for various kinds of wool. What a mess! As it turns out, it, it's really hard to measure the diameter of a yarn. Yarn is not a rigid object. Squeezing it into a micrometer will just flatten it out. And trying to measure it through a magnifying glass or even a microscope doesn't help much because most yarn has a fuzzy boundary. If you look at a piece of yarn closely, it doesn't have flat edges that we can measure the diameter of. With all that fuzz on it, where does the yarn end and the air begin? Will three different inspectors make the same measurement? These are problems people have had for centuries in measuring the exact diameter of a yarn. The best we can do is measure the yarn's total length and weight to get a sense of the diameter. And the result is what we call the yarn's weight, but it's really not weight. Understanding a few things about yarn weights will allow you a lot more creativity and freedom in your choices of yarns to use for a project. Currently, there are over a dozen different yarn numbering systems in use. But unless you are in the yarn manufacturing or textile business, these don't really mean much. Yarn numbering systems like Denier and Tex are rarely included on any yarn labels for hand knitters, at least in the US. So for us, there are no official universal categories for yarn weights. 
However, within the last 15 to 20 years, a new yarn categorization system has been developed by the Craft Yarn Council of America. This, this system was designed to help bring uniformity to yarn and patterns. It was designed to enable consumers to select the correct yarn and needles for a project and complete it successfully. The idea is that specific diameters of yarn should produce a somewhat predictable number of stitches when using a particular size needle. This weight system has been adopted by many yarn manufacturers, publishers, and designers in the United States, but not all of them. And the Craft Yarn Council is trying to get these standards implemented worldwide. The Craft Yarn Council system consists of eight weights or thicknesses, ranging from zero, which is the finest, thinnest yarn, to seven, which is very thick yarn. You can see samples of yarn in different weights displayed in this picture. And the various yarn weights are represented by these symbols at the bottom of the screen, which you might have seen in patterns or on yarn labels. The higher the number, the heavier the yarn, and the fewer stitches per inch you'll get when knitting with it. So let's quickly review each of these yarn weights and talk about what they're commonly used for. I've actually typed up an Excel spreadsheet with all the information I'm going to talk about today in it, and you can download that through the link in the information box below this video. First, let's talk about lace weight yarn. Lace weight yarn has the narrowest diameter and is mostly used for knitting lace, as the name indicates. This category covers the thinnest crochet thread, cobweb yarn, lace weight yarn, and light fingering weight yarn. In the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, these yarns are commonly known as one ply, two ply, and three ply, but keep in mind that these terms are a little misleading because yarn weight doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the number of plies in a yarn. So recognize that this is just a labeling custom that has continued through the years. The recommended needle size for the lace yarn category is a US size 1 or 2.25 millimeter or less. But most knitters use a larger size needle to make the lace look very open, sheer, and flowy. I just did a little search on Pinterest and found these beautiful lacy items made out of lace weight yarn. Lovely knit shawls like this one and this one. Crocheted tablecloths. Crocheted doilies. Knit wedding veils. And even this beautiful hand knit wedding dress. So all of these would be examples of what you could make with lace weight yarn. The second category of yarn is named superfine, which a lot of people call fingering weight or sock yarn. It is approximately equivalent to four ply yarn. People often ask why it's called fingering weight. Well, the term fingering comes from the French phrase fin grain, which means fine grain or very thin yarn. And that term fin grain morphed into the word fingering in English, but it has nothing to do with the fingers. For the recommended needle size for fingering weight yarn, this is a US 1 to 3, which is a 2.25 to 3.25 millimeter needle. Fingering weight yarn is commonly used for socks, of course, but you can also make many other things like hats, fingerless mitts, and baby items like this lovely layette set. So again, that is super fine yarn or fingering weight yarn. Fine yarn is the next category and it is often referred to as sport weight. It is about the same as five ply yarn and the suggested needle size is a US three to five or 3.25 to 3.75 millimeter. Sport weight yarn is very popular for baby items like this beautiful baby blanket this baby sweater, and these baby booties. I've also seen people make sweaters out of it, like this pretty one, and gorgeous shawls like this one. So those are some ideas of what you can make with fine or sport weight yarn. Moving on, 
The next category is labeled light yarn, which most people call DK weight, and it is the same thickness as eight ply yarn. DK stands for double knitting, and you might wonder where that name came from. Well, there are a couple of anecdotes floating around as to the origin of this label. The first is that the yarn was used during World War II in British factories where it could double as or replace either sport weight or worsted weight yarn. And this was a good thing because it was economical to be able to use a single yarn in place of either a lighter weight or a heavier weight yarn in times when supplies of especially wool yarn were limited. The other story says that DK weight yarn was originally created by knitting with two strands of fingering weight yarn. Now early knitters were working with very thin yarns and fingering weight was kind of the standard weight of yarn. So holding it double to knit things like sweaters would make the projects go faster. So those are at least two possible ways that double knitting or DK weight yarn was named. If you know another one, let me know down below. The suggested needle size for DK weight yarn is a US 5 to 7, which is a 3.75 to 4.5 millimeter needle. As far as what to make with DK weight yarn, well, like I just said, you can make sweaters with it, like this knit one and this crocheted one. You can make hats, scarves, shawls, cowls, and even socks. So that gives you some ideas for DK weight yarn projects. Okay, going up a little bit in thickness is medium yarn, which is commonly called worsted weight, and it's equivalent to 10 ply. The recommended needle size is a US 7 to 9 or a 4.5 to 5.5 millimeter. You might wonder where the name Worsted came from. Well, this yarn weight was named after the small English village of Worsted, which was a yarn manufacturing and weaving center dating back to the 12th century. It was here that woven textiles were crafted for over 600 years. Although the village is no longer the manufacturing giant it once was, the yarn still bears its name today. According to retailers in the U.S., worsted weight is the most popular weight for knitting and crocheting. Common projects with worsted weight yarn are things like afghans, sweaters, hats, scarves, mittens, and home decor items like pillows and blankets. So those are some examples of items you can make with worsted weight yarn. Getting into even thicker yarns, our next category is bulky yarn, which is also known as chunky and 12 ply. The needle size suggested is a US size nine to 11, which is a 5.5 to eight millimeter. This heavier weight yarn is popular for making things like sweaters and rugs. The next category is called super bulky, which is also known as super chunky and 14 ply. The suggested needle size is a US 11 to 17, which is an eight to 12 millimeter needle. And this is used for similar items as the bulky yarn I just talked about, like heavy blankets, rugs, and sweaters. Finally, the thickest yarn is called jumbo, which is also known as extra bulky, roving, and 16 ply. This is a new category that was recently added because of the popularity of these ultra thick yarns that people are arm knitting with. The suggested needle size is a US 17 or larger, which corresponds to a 12 millimeter or larger. But as I said, a lot of people are using this yarn for arm knitting where their arms actually serve as the knitting needles. With this yarn, most people are making big chunky blankets like this one and rugs like this one. All right, so that gives you a little overview of the eight categories of yarn designated by the Craft Yarn Council of America. 
And this system is a nice framework for understanding yarn weights, but you have to remember that the boundaries between these yarn categories are not set in stone. For one thing, different manufacturers may label yarn differently. And sometimes yarn in the same category varies a lot in thickness. As an example, look at these yarns I found in my stash. All of them are labeled as DK weight yarn, but you might be able to see that they look different in terms of thickness. From left to right, we have a 100% merino wool, a cotton linen blend, a biosynthetic viscose, and a wool silk blend. Now to me, the cotton linen yarn looks thinner than the rest, and the wool silk yarn looks thicker. Yet, they are all considered DK weight. The interesting thing is that when I knit swatches with them, they all knit up very differently. For these swatches, I cast on 30 stitches on a US size 5 or 3.75 millimeter needle, and I used the exact same needle for all four swatches. In this picture, going clockwise from the top left, you see the viscose yarn, the top right is the wool, the bottom right is the cotton linen blend, and the bottom left is the wool silk blend. When you look at the completed swatches, I think the first thing you might notice is that the wool yarn knit up into a denser, more solid looking fabric. In fact, the entire swatch is obviously smaller than all the rest. My gauge on that one was five and a half stitches per inch, which was the tightest gauge of all of them. And my loosest gauge was with the viscose yarn, the green one at the upper left, at five stitches per inch. Now the one that looks the loosest is the cotton linen blend, the pink one at the bottom right, and my gauge for that one was 5.25 stitches per inch. The weird thing is that my gauge for the viscose and the cotton linen yarns is the same. So the thing is, even though these yarns are all considered DK weight, you can see that they look differently when you examine their thickness, and they knit up completely differently with different gauges and different fabric appearance. This is why it's so important to knit a gauge swatch. One factor that's causing their different appearance is the fiber composition of the yarn. Even if it's spun to the same thickness, different fibers will have different weights for the same length of yarn. In general, cotton weighs more than wool. Cotton and wool both weigh more than linen, and all of these weigh more than silk. Those are just some examples, so it's not only the diameter of the yarn that matters, but also what the yarn is made out of. So let's look at the four DK weight yarns I swatched and compare their yardage per 100 grams. The wool silk blend yarn, and that's the yellow one on the lower left, has the most yardage with 274 yards per 100 grams. So that means it's the lightest weight yarn of the bunch. The cotton linen blend, which is the pink one, has 252 yards per 100 grams, which is pretty similar to the wool yarn, the gold one on the top right, at 246 yards per 100 grams. The heaviest yarn in this comparison was the viscose yarn, which is the green one in the upper left corner, coming in at 219 yards per 100 grams. Now at this point you might be confused, because all of these yarns are supposed to be DK weight, and they're indicated as DK weight right on the yarn labels, but they look different, they knit up different, and they have different yardage for the same unit of weight. Well, in order to sort this out, there's something else you can do to get more information about each particular yarn, and that is count wraps per inch. Wraps per inch, or WPI, is the number of strands of yarn that fit side by side within one inch. You can easily measure WPI by winding your yarn around a ruler or a pencil or really anything that maintains a constant diameter. You don't want to use something tapered, like this pen would not be good because it's narrower, narrower on the end and thicker in the middle. You can even buy special WPI gauges like this one that I have that is in the shape of a cute little sheep 
And this is from Girl on the Rocks. I like that it has the built-in cheat sheet, which lists how many wraps per inch are representative of the different yarn weights. Like for fingering weight, you should get around 14 wraps per inch. For worsted weight, you should get about nine. And for bulky, you should get around seven. Anyway, you just wind your yarn around the gauge or whatever you're using, making sure each strand is touching the next, but not squashed together. Now here's the interesting thing. When I measured my wraps per inch for the four DK weight yarns, I got different results. And this is not as rare as you might think. These yarns are all listed on Ravelry as having 11 wraps per inch, which is the norm for DK weight yarn. In reality though, they don't all have 11 wraps per inch, at least when I did it. The cotton linen blend came out to 14 wraps per inch and so did the viscose yarn. And that would put them more into the fingering weight category. I think you can see that, especially in the cotton linen swatch, which is the pink one. You can really see how loose the stitches are, which means that if you're going for a more dense filled in fabric, then the needle is too big for this yarn. The Merino Silk Blend yarn had 12 wraps per inch, which is closer to a sport weight yarn. And lastly, the 100% Merino Wool yarn came out to 11 wraps per inch, which is exactly what you would expect from a DK weight yarn. So the wool yarn, and that is the gold swatch in the upper right hand corner, is really the only one of these that comes out to be DK weight according to the wraps per inch measurement. All right, if you're still with me, it's time to put all this jumbled information to good use. The bottom line here is that you can use all the yarn characteristics I've talked about today to help you find the recommended yarn weight for a pattern or to choose another yarn to substitute in a pattern. There are three main steps to accomplish these goals. First, find out what yarn weight the pattern calls for whether it's the Craft Yarn Council's numeric symbol or just called fingering weight, DK weight, worsted weight, or what have you. Many designers include the yarn weight in the pattern. The pattern page on Ravelry will usually include information about yarn weight as well. Knowing the recommended yarn's weight is a good starting point, but as I talked about earlier, even yarns in the same weight category can vary in thickness. So this brings me to the second point. Look on the pattern for the recommended gauge and wraps per inch. You can generally find this information on Ravelry as well. If you're substituting yarn, the best thing to do is look for a yarn that has the manufacturer's recommended gauge similar to that of the yarn the pattern designer used. Most patterns today give you the exact number of yards needed for a project rather than just the number of skeins of yarn the designer used. So if you're substituting yarn, make sure you have enough yardage and be sure to knit a swatch to determine if the combination of yarn and needles is right for that pattern. And third, look at the fiber content of the yarn the designer used because this will determine how the final product will look and behave. For example, a ribbed pullover sweater designed for wool can be made in cotton, but it won't be as stretchy or as warm, and it will probably be heavier too. If you want to substitute yarn of a different fiber content, pay attention to things like elasticity, breathability, insulation, and laundering. Elasticity means that the yarn keeps its original shape and doesn't stretch out. Wool is very elastic, acrylic has pretty good elasticity, and cotton and alpaca usually are not elastic, meaning that garments will sag or stretch out of shape. For breathability, natural fibers are generally better at allowing sweat to escape and dry, and synthetics less so. For winter garments, think about how insulating the fiber is. Wool and alpaca have excellent insulating properties, whereas cotton and linen don't as much. And for laundering, consider whether the finished object will need to be washed frequently. 
new parents are not likely to want to wash baby clothes or blankets by hand. So it's often best to use yarn that can be thrown into the washing machine for those kinds of items. So keep these issues in mind. So you substitute a yarn with similar properties and care instructions. One last point I wanted to make today has to do with substituting yarn for the yarn recommended in a given pattern. There is a super useful and convenient website called yarnsub.com, which will help you find a substitute yarn. All you have to do is go to yarnsub.com, enter in the name of the yarn you want to find a substitute for, and it will find you dozens of options for yarn substitutions. Let me show you an example here. Let's say we want to make this sweater pattern called Drake. I found the pattern page here on Ravelry, and you can see that the suggested yarn is Briggs & Little Regal, which is a worsted weight yarn. And this sweater requires 1,200 to 1,800 yards of yarn, depending on what size you make. But let's say we can't get a hold of the Briggs & Little Regal yarn, so we want to buy something else, or maybe we want to use a yarn that we have in our stash. In that case, we can go to yarnsub.com and type in Briggs and Little Regal, hit enter to perform the search, and then it asks us, is this the yarn you're talking about? Just click on the yarn name and the system analyzes the qualities of that yarn and provides you with a list of similar yarns. You'll notice that in this example, the original yarn is worsted weight, but some of the suggested substitutions are listed as DK weight. However, they have the exact same gauge as the original yarn, and that's what's important. It also has information about how close the match is. The top one is a 99% match, and as you scroll down, the last one is an 89% match, which is still pretty good. You get information about the price level, the more dollar signs means more expensive. It also gives you the fiber content and the qualities of the yarn and how closely those match the original. And it presents information about the yardage of the substitute yarn and how many balls of yarn are equivalent to the original yarn. Finally, in many cases, you can click right through to an online vendor to purchase the yarn. Now, if you're wanting to use a yarn in your stash as a substitute yarn, you can do one of two things. You can scroll through the yarn substitute options on yarnsub.com and see if you have any of these suggested yarns in your stash. And if not, you can use all the information I talked about in this video to evaluate the yarn in your stash, particularly the yarn weight, the gauge, and the fiber content. I guess the take home message here is that yarn weights are important to understand, but probably the most crucial thing is gauge. In the end, all this other data only helps us predict with more accuracy how the yarn will knit up, but it's not until we put that yarn and needle combo together in knitting a gauge swatch that we know if they're right for our project. Well, that brings us to the end of class today. And now I would love to hear from you in the comment section below. Let me know how you figure out what yarns to use for a project or how to substitute yarns. How do you feel about the Craft Yarn Council's yarn numbering system? How would you change it to make it better? You can also leave questions about today's show and ideas for future show topics or just a comment to say hi. Reading your comments is always my favorite part of doing these videos. And as always, I will include links to everything I talked about today in the information box right below this video. Just click on show more to open up the box and you'll see all the links there. I'll see you next time. And until then, stay smart and have a sparkly week.